My name is Tro Yongye, the giant ibis, the national bird of Cambodia. We used to be many and lived from Thailand to Vietnam. Now I'm one of the few left, only found in northern Cambodia. I am the only member of my genus, a survivor of 38 million years of unique evolutionary heritage. How grand we were with our three foot long bodies, nine inch long beaks, and piercing dark red eyes. How I miss the times of old where my family and I would swoop through the landscape looking for swampy clearings, ponds, and rivers where we would feast on insects in these ponds full of life, our calls echoing through the forest. We lived together in harmony with people for centuries. People created ancient ponds and kept them open. They sang about us in their folk songs. Our loud ringing calls were entwined with farmers' lives, signaling that it was time to go to the fields. They saw us as intelligent birds. Indeed, we've never returned to the places where we've nearly been hunted down before. My partner and I would sing duets in the crisp dawn air. No wonder the traditional Khmer stories say that the giant ibis call signals the introduction of love. But then, within a decade or two, cars and planes took over the planet and the thirst for more raw material to make tires and to roll in the cash meant that large swaths of forests were converted to monoculture rubber plantations. We lost our trees, our nests, our breeding grounds. Now, will we remain a living symbol of Cambodia? Or will we remain only as a memory, the great bird sung about in folk songs and folk tales? about the meaning of love and the life of farmers past. The helmeted hornbill's laughing song once resonated across the dense lowland forests of Southeast Asia. The bird's distinctive head was a marvel to those lucky enough to catch sight of it. Atop its striking red beak and head sat a large rising structure, fading from yellow to bright red. The hornbill's distinctive ivory cask or helmet. This symbol of nobility both created the bird's distinctive call and attracted its mates. The hornbill glides between huge fruit-bearing trees on dark wings, trailing majestic white tail feathers hanging ethereally behind the bird as it searched for the choicest of fruits. This in turn ensured the futures of the trees as the birds spread those seeds far and wide. And amidst those same tall trees, the birds also find their nests, sealing the female in small nest cavities with the young, utterly reliant on the male to bring those fruits. But now those dense forests no longer echo with their clarion call. Instead, a cacophony of saws, guns and trucks reverberate through the forest. Trees fall daily, and once expansive forests are no more than a distant memory. In their place there are only fragments of what was, and legions of uniform plantations stretching to the horizon. The spectacular tall trees the hornbills once nested in are now scattered, isolated in islands of forests amidst the ocean of our progress. Those birds lucky enough to find a nest wait patiently for the males to return, bringing food and hope for a new generation. Often, though, they wait in vain as the males fail to return. The forest is no longer a refuge, the fruit is no longer plentiful, and they are no longer alone. Those prominent casks, once a signal of their health and vitality, are now their undoing. 
Hunters stalk the remaining forests, seeking the birds for this unique red ivory. We humans fancy that such an ornament when carved would look better in our home than swooping through the dense forests. Organised groups now scour the forest, taking any and all hornbills they find, removing thousands of birds each year, emptying the trees and filling marketplaces. Our greed and unsustainable desire for these birds will leave us only empty forests and carvings, a tawdry exchange by any measure. We come together on this very sad occasion to bid farewell to the straw-headed bulbul. Just a few short decades ago, this nightingale of the rainforest was common to many regions from the Malay Peninsula to Borneo. Its decline was precipitous. We all remember its beautiful haunting song, but it was this voice that led to the bulbul's heartbreaking demise. It was not enough for this rich, melodious song to be heard in the lush rainforests where these birds once lived. People seem consumed by the desire to cage them, to have this song close at hand, to own it. As a result, trade in these songbirds caused population reductions across the species range, a major barrier to its conservation. Trapping then intensified owing to the spread of logging roads across the forest. And then came the loss of vital habitat due to the expansion of palm oil plantation. All of these factors managed to drive the species to endangerment and then extinction. The straw-headed bulbuls were raised in an untidy nest of interwoven vegetation, placed in vines or ferns above the ground. Each nest contained only two precious eggs. An extended family sometimes cooperated in nurturing bulbul chicks in their upbringing, like human aunts or uncles. Pairs of straw-headed bulbuls would sing duets each taking up a different part of the same song and seem to do so effortlessly. This interplay of melodies resonates strongly with us as bulbuls learn songs in the same way as humans learn speech, an intimate connection at the neurological level. We may never fully understand the meaning of the bulbul song, especially from the scant recordings that remain, but we know it was necessary for the bulbuls to establish territories and attract mates. For us, this song was a gift, freely given, and yet our species chose to punish the birds for that gift by depriving them of their freedom, their place to live, and ultimately, their existence. Today we mourn the loss of the father of all birds, the harpy eagle. Rivaled by none, revered by all. An irreplaceable cornerstone of the forest is lost, and with it the chance of future generations to observe its majesty atop the tallest and grandest canopies. The world's largest eagle once reigned supreme over the Amazon, the world's largest tropical rainforest. Swooping to strip prey from the forest floor to the canopy, shifting its immense body with speed and agility and snatching prey in its bear-sized claws. The harpy eagle kept the forest in balance, moderating the populations of those it preyed upon, an indicator of a healthy, functioning forest. The eagle leaves behind a cultural legacy equal to its size. Known as the father of all birds by indigenous communities who shared the forest with this spectre, Indigenous people offered the bird the respect it deserved. The harp eagle was seen as the personification of community leaders, demonstrating the immense respect given to the bird by forest communities and the paternal nature the eagle offered to the forest. Its presence has permeated culture across the globe, 
from Panama to Harry Potter, we are all poorer for its departure. The reign of the Harpy Eagle has come to an end, dooming the Royal Hawk to the history books. The bulldozers came with phenomenal speed that even this eagle could not evade, clearing the land and destroying all before them. The trees came tumbling down, taking with them incomprehensible levels of biodiversity, sending forest dwellers scuttling for refuge in the small remaining fragments. Very few remain in the deserts of grass, soy and cattle that have taken the place of these ancient forests. The loss of the eagle indicates a forest that is dying. How long is left for those that remain? You were a social species living in small family groups, up high at the tops of the trees in the rainforest of Borneo. Your long slender limbs made you elegant dancers as you moved through the trees with speed and grace, swinging from branch to branch. Your favorite food? Ripe fruits, young leaves, and small insects. Always the benevolent spirit, you dispersed so many important seeds helping the forest regrow and continue to thrive. You lived in peace in the rainforest until humans decided to keep you as pets and destroy your forest home. Your babies were taken away, one by one. There were no more treetops to live on, nothing left to eat, and nowhere else to go. Now who will help the forest regrow? You never liked being on the forest floor. It was easier to defend your territory from the top with your beautiful song. I remember the first time I heard you in the Bornean rainforest. It was at the break of dawn, a song so hauntingly beautiful that I first thought you were a large bird. Your song could be heard kilometers away, echoing through the landscape. You were always so elusive, up high in the treetops difficult to catch even a glimpse of. But your song was always a welcome reassurance that you were there. Now the silence is deafening, a constant reminder of what the world has lost forever. <laughs> 